And so, as the sixth stressed Prime Minister set out on his last election battle, he was vainly trying to suppress economic crisis. I don't think we're going to lose. The bright, enthusiastic Muldoon who entered Parliament 24 years earlier had changed into a creature totally consumed by power. He could not think of life without it Minister, and would do almost anything to keep to it. On a run ZB he declined uh, to see us uh, consistently through that period and indeed uh, Spencer Russell, the governor of the bank, and uh, I uh, saw him on only one occasion uh, to talk about the foreign exchange crisis and the monetary situation. While Russell and Dean at the Reserve Bank and Treasury officials burned with crisis, next door at Parliament, Muldoon fiddled. I think we borrowed about $1.7 billion uh, in the space of four weeks, and indeed on the first weekend after the election had been announced, we put together a package of around $600 million over the telephone without documentation. During that campaign, they didn't even want to know. I think deep down he knew. One only had to be given the sort of polling that I was giving him on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Sir Robert. Robert Muldoon sounded tired. I don't think they will trust a socialist trade union party. But David Longy, after only 18 months as Labour's leader, was the one sounding like a Prime Minister. You are the and if Muldoon didn't already know, he had a flash of realisation in the leader's debate. I that your party has an honourable tradition. And I think that there are people in it who are prepared to be part of that recovery. Thank you. I give them after July 15 the chance to do that. Thank you very much. Mr. I love Lange. you, Mr. Lance. I love you, Mr. Lance. I sort of sat there and watched, and tears welled in his eyes, and eventually he sort of put his paper together. And in that terribly lonely way that he had, he walked off and went into a room. And I remember his policeman, Jock Munro, was there, and. and uh, but there was no one to whom he turned, no comfort, no solicitude from anyone. Um, there was the man who really spoke to his staff, who was at a television studio on the most traumatic evening of his television life, probably. And into the little room off the side he went, uh, crying. And in his moment of truth, the ruthless power seeker was once again a shy, sad little boy. Despite the tears, Robert Muldoon would still try to hide the crisis his policies had created. All he'd really done was manipulate the economy to stay in power. In 67, when he replaced Harry Lake, overseas debt was 390 million. It was 8 billion. In 1967, inflation was 4%. Under Muldoon, it reached 18%. There were just under 1,000 unemployed in 67. By 1984, there were 130,000. And under Muldoon, government expenditure climbed by a third. How do you quantify blame? <laughs> he had failed, and on election night 84 at the Koei Tennis Club, New Zealand told him. We have a Prime Minister. You said that if you couldn't beat Mr. Long in an election, you didn't deserve to be Prime Minister or leader of the National Party. Is that still your view? Oh, well, if I said that, I'm certainly not saying it tonight. I'll be very quiet, please. Bro. On the line now. The first inkling something was badly wrong came on election night when David Longy took the call from Sir Robert conceding defeat. <laughs> I said, congratulations, uh, you've got some bad news coming. Some officials will be briefing you. And uh, one wondered what that could have been. And it turned out, of course, to be the, the foreign exchange crisis. Sir Robert would soon be under siege from all sides. First indication was the terrible silence when he returned to his hotel on election night. There was the usual function, and no one rang. I thought that was a very sad occasion. There was not one phone call. When you're f finished, with one becomes very disposable. I saw the savagery of politics. What followed was farce and tragedy. His gracelessness and defeat surprised no one. Brian Talboys had always had the, the, the theory that, uh, that the end of Muldoon would be very painful uh, and that Muldoon uh, would have one ambition and that would be uh, to be an atlas and walk out of the temple with a a pillar under each arm as he went out and pulled the temple down behind him. 
uh, which of course was precisely what happened. For days, the country was like a banana republic as he refused to devalue and the foreign exchange markets had to close. We felt that if we did not do that, the amount of speculation would have just been gigantic uh, and probably unsustainable in terms of our reserve position at that time. But while the incoming government and officials wrestled with the foreign exchange fiasco, national party leaders were after his head within hours of defeat. I said to him then, I think you, you're going to have to think about your leadership. I just have a gut feel that the party is not going to want you to stay on for le as leader for much longer, Rob. He said, look, I, I don't want you to get emotional. You're feeling tired. I can understand. So and he hadn't, accepted. he hadn't accepted it and he was still working in his office the Sunday after the election. My advice to him at this moment is not devalue. Robert Muldoon's remaining days as the national leader will be nasty, brutal and short. Three challengers had their hats in the ring within days. And his friends started to wind him up and he started to get uh, very vicious. He said that he would see that um, that the, the blame for the election rested with me and the party, that it was a lousy campaign and that he'd see that I carried uh, the responsibility for it. And of course we had, a, we had the drama of having a scheduled party conference two weeks after the, uh, the election, which was a terribly tense uh, uh, exercise to go into. He was unable to accept life without power. And as soon as he was replaced by party high flyer Jim McClay, his old code of loyalty meant nothing. Uh, my, my colleagues. He immediately set about destroying McClay. Some of us, including myself, were, were anxious that, that McClay was not put into the leadership role immediately. That, that Muldoon would attack whoever went in and would destroy them. I mean, he really went against his own principles by. Uh, you know, being quite openly disloyal of Jim McClay. Sir Robert was one of those who gave his undertaking, and I would expect him and all... He's demanded that uh, everybody uh, give him total loyalty, and uh, so the caucus has said yes. If Robert Muldoon couldn't win, no one else could either. But even at the height of his venom, he was two people, a revengeful monster and a sad little boy. He sat on the couch in his room and held my hand, just just held onto my hand. Sad in the way you're putting it. And I was absolutely determined that he was going to go down to the house when the new leader was welcomed. Uh, sad for all the people who feel and express a sense of loss. I took him down and basically escorted him into the house. It was, um, it was very sad and he wasn't prepared for it. It's nine years to the day since you were first elected as Prime Minister. Is it? Exactly. Ah, um, look at that. If that was the pinnacle of... It's also my mother's birthday.